Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Jonathan McNeese. Always late to the party as I am, McNeese Knives first came on my radar with the very small and adorable Spyderco collaboration locking folder, the McB. And my saying it's adorable does not take away from its capability. It's just a small knife. Little did I know at the time, Jonathan had a thriving custom knife business with fixed blades and folding designs ranging from dressed up to totally practical and uh, tactical and all the cool stuff in between. But his latest folder, the Mac 2 3.5 inch, is what has the knife world so excited these days. And it's a classic, simple clip point blade on a clean titanium frame held together with an ultra, ultra smooth action, or so I hear. Haven't experienced it myself. It's also a knife that's created to bring Jonathan's designs to a broader audience, but it's not coming to you how you might think it is. Uh, but before we get into all of that, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Download us on the uh, on the podcast apps. Uh, that way, you can you don't have to look at us the whole time. You can finish it on the way to work tomorrow, or something like that. And then also go check us out on Patreon. That way, you'll get to hear a little bit of extra uh, interview and conversation that I have with Jonathan on the tail end. All right, so uh, the best way to do that is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Now in its 42nd edition, Knives 2022 is the annual showcase of the most remarkable custom and factory manufactured knives in one remarkable collection. Get your copy today at the knifejunkie.com slash knives 2022. Jonathan, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure. And I want to congratulate you on the Mac 2 3.5 inch. It's it's been uh it's been uh catching fire and people are just crazy about this knife. Well, thank you. I, we we've really enjoyed it. It's been a uh, um you know, it was kind of weird. We came out with a 3 inch just because uh the just the Mac 2 um because that's kind of the size I like to carry. Uh, I never really thought that much about the size, honestly. I just you know this is what I like. So I, I made this and then immediately, I mean, probably the first 15 or 20 we got out there, people started asking for a larger one. And so we pretty much immediately planned to start doing one. It was just a matter of making it happen. And, and yeah, we, uh, luckily the, the hype has gotten behind it a little bit and, uh, hopefully deserved, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, we've, we've had some good people, honestly, though, that have, uh, as far as like what I would call a hype, we've had some good people that, that got their hands on, uh, some of the, uh, prototypes that we had at Blade this year, and they've really done a good job of helping to spread the word, uh, which has made a lot of difference. So, so yeah, I really appreciate those guys. As always, all of our people are really good about supporting us. So, uh, that's a great thing about, uh, thriving YouTube knife world and i'm not even sure if that's who you're referring to uh but the fact that there are so many knife enthusiasts that we can now kind of track their taste and track uh how they review and how they um evaluate a knife and when you learn to trust them you know if they say this thing is amazing which is what people are saying about the mac 2 3.5 then you know that they're and that you know that it's Right. The real deal. So uh, I want to talk all about the process of getting these Mac 2 knives made. But before we do, uh, there has to be a, a real challenge in taking a three inch knife and turning it into a three point five inch knife. I would imagine it's not just hitting the times whatever percent. I don't know. I'm not good at math. Yeah. And hitting equals. Um, No, but in this case, it actually was pretty easy because of the design, because it's just a good basic frame lock design without anything really weird. Um, we really did just kind of scale it up. So the ratio between the length of the blade and the length of the handle pretty much is the same ratio as far as the, the length versus the height of the handle. Mm -hmm. It pretty much stayed the same between the, the two, three inch and the three and a half inch. Um, we did stick with the same thickness of, uh, material with the handle and with the blade. So, so while the three inch seems it's actually not that chunky of a knife, but it, it seems a little thicker and kind of chunky. 
we took the same thickness materials and stretched it out to the three and a half inch. And now it actually kind of feels slim and a little on the thinner side because of that. So, and to be honest, part of that was a uh, decision from the manufacturing side of things because sticking with the same size materials meant way less changes that we had to do on the manufacturing side. So mm-hmm. that plus I, I like you know, the thinner edges and the thinner, the thinner blade stock and everything. So we decided to just, stick with that route. It's kind of better all the way around. Uh, that also having that thinner, um, overall, uh, handle, uh, thickness, but with a broader, um, handle overall, uh, I, I feel like it gives you a little bit more control in the hand. Uh, there's going to be yeah. less turning because it's more rectangular or, right. or, yeah. or whatever. So, so the Mac, the Mac two, uh, the three inch was the first one mm-hmm. that you kind of produced in this way. Is that right? Where- yeah, it really is. Um, I had one back a few years ago that was called the PM1. It was where the performance machine thing came into play. Um, so I, at that point, I, I got real creative and just called it the <laughs> performance machine one or PM1. Um, but it what? was actually different. It was when I was still working completely by myself. Um, mm-hmm. And so basically I had, it was probably more like what people would call a true traditional mid-tech where I had the uh, the parts cut and the milling and drilling done. Uh, the blades were um, profiled and the holes in them and everything, but they were hand ground. All the, the lock D10, all that was fit by hand. So really probably a true mid tech by the true definition of it. And uh, um, that was, I guess, kind of my first toe in the water for that. I think we did, I think I did 50, um, which is a lot when you're hand grinding them all. Um, mm-hmm. So, and completely by yourself, I did 50 in that run. And then, basically back to making customs for a couple more years before I finally decided to uh, expand and start hiring people and stuff. So, well, so how does that work now with, um, with your custom work? You're still doing both, right? Yeah. Yeah. I am to, to be fair, the custom stuff has, has slowed way down, especially in the last, but we've been, we've been in a transition phase. Um, I was still doing customs up until basically the Vegas show, the gathering, uh, took customs to that, and I don't think I've actually made one since then. But I mean, that was just September. It's not, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's not quite that that long. Although it seems like forever. Um, basically, we we came back from Vegas and moved into a new shop, and so the transition from that and had a couple new employees along with moving in the new shop. So we've been trying to get our processes up and running. Just got a new uh, a new Haas mill in the shop that I'm working mm-hmm. on figuring out how to use. So yes. I do still make them. Have I made one the last couple of months? No. <laughs> so uh, I do plan on continuing to make some, but, but not at the pace, obviously, that I, that I did before when that was all I did. So there'll right. be there'll be a lot fewer and further between now. But but yeah, well, I still plan on making the full customs. Okay, so now you're upscaling. You're upscaling your company so that you can uh, take on um, more. I mean, there's obviously a demand for the Mac Two knives. And you're, you've hired a few new people and you've moved to a larger space. You've gotten this Haas mill. Um, this is kind of exciting it, because in a way it's, it's going to allow you to, um, I would imagine this is, uh, you're aiming at taking this, it, the out of house stuff and bringing it back in house, but in a more, um, right. you know, um, mechanized way. Right. Yeah, definitely. Definitely in the long run for the short term, what I plan on doing, because we've got our, the pipeline that I've gotten built, which is basically a network that I've built over almost my entire career of doing this, just making, you know, networking, making friends, getting contacts for this service or that service. Um, we've got it going pretty good now. It still has its inevitable delays, but uh, we're, we've got it clicking pretty good. So on the Mac 2 and the 3.5, I plan on continuing to do them pretty much the same way that we're doing them through the same channels. Um, but then the next new model that we're going to do, which is yet to be revealed, I will probably do much more of the processes in house. So we'll kind of have two streams, give us a little diversity too, because that way, if something happens, you know, and our pipeline gets clogged up, which it always does, we get, you know, bottlenecks somewhere along the line and we're waiting on somebody and parts get delayed. Well, then we're not just dead in the water. We can be still making some parts for a different model in house and vice versa. If something happens and I have the mills tied up or it's down for some reason, then we still hopefully have parts coming in from another source. So we're not just completely, you know, yeah. all our eggs aren't in one basket there. Yeah. I mean, eventually, long term, more of it will probably end up coming in house. I mean, I don't know what will happen with that, but 
for the foreseeable future. I, I think we'll we'll continue to do the ones we have established the way we're doing them because they're dialed pretty good and and then start doing more new stuff in house. I mean, that seems to me like uh, two things, and they and they might seem contra- not contradictory, but on the opposite ends. On one end, uh, I, it sounds like a very smart business move because you can always be producing. Uh, no matter uh, no matter what the the, the uh, exterior situation is, but I as a as an artist and someone who had artistic training think of it as yeah you always have to have like multiple projects going so that when you have a mind block with one you can you right. can break through it by working on something else. But in a sense, that's kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Different uh different uh reasons or I don't know you know behind it, but uh different right, benefit right. from it I guess. But yeah. Yeah, kind of the same thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably a little little ADHD or ADD. <laughs> so, uh, I, I kind of have to have yeah a lot of things bouncing around, so that's that's not unusual. Well, d- so describe what it was like um, going from a uh, custom knife maker only to the first time you had uh, the Mac two parts uh, come in that you were going to work on. That that must have been a crazy experience. Yeah, it it was, but it wasn't too bad either. It, it was scary. Um, it was probably more scary when I actually hired us. So, well, so I had my daughter and my son, of course, growing up. They had both worked for me a little bit doing assorted things. And when I, I got a laser engraver and when I got that, they both worked for me some doing that. And my son had worked for me some off and on kind of part time doing that. Um, and then, and then I think he wasn't at the time. And then I hired a guy named Chase, Chase Boatwright. Um, he he came on full time with me. He came to the shop and started doing some apprentice type stuff. And then I hired him full time. And it was after that, that I kind of hit the gas on the, uh, on the Mac two project because I, I was able to do it then. Cause again, back to the diversity thing, basically we, I took the time to help. We got the processes set up, figured out how we were going to do all the stuff we needed to do in house, uh, trained him on how to do stuff. And, before too long he caught on really quick and pretty quickly we were able i was able to kind of keep him working on the mac twos so he'd be at one desk over working on the mac twos and i'd be on the other side of the shop this was an old shop so it was we were it was pretty close but <laughs> um but we were we were he was kind of doing his thing building those and and i would sharpen all of them and i would occasionally troubleshoot something or, or whatever and check in and we'd refine a process but but he was able to handle a lot of that which which allowed me to still keep making the customs that if I had had to just drop and do nothing but that, I mean, because obviously there's only one of me. If I'd had to just focus on just doing the production type stuff and had to drop the customs, it would have been a lot scarier. But it kind of let me kind of had the best of both worlds a little bit. So mm-hmm. that definitely helped get making a making a good first hire was definitely a, a lucky move. So, well, yeah, but before you said that it was lucky and good, you said it was scary. It was that it was even scarier than going mid tech. What about it was scary entrusting your work and your name into someone else's hands or knowing that you're responsible for that person's livelihood? Both, honestly. And I don't know which one I could say would, would be more scary. Um, probably almost the, for me, my personality, probably almost more, I mean, my product and my name on it means a ton to me, but somebody else's livelihood and you know what happens to their family and stuff is probably actually even more important to me so that's that's that holds a lot of weight that that was definitely scary the fact that you know now now if i do something stupid or <laughs> whatever it doesn't affect just me so uh yeah that that part of it probably outweighed the 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 business side of it for sure but now you have a, a trusted uh someone working with you and I'm sorry, I for, I've forgotten his name already. But uh, Chase, that's fine. Chase, I'm sorry. So now that you have Chase and you trust him, now he can help when you bring new people on. He knows right. the standard. He was, yep. you know, so in a yep. way that makes it easier breaking that ice that first time. Yep. Um, but you've also mentioned your family in in this operation, and to me, mm-hmm. um, I, I I always get a little bit uh, sentimental when I I, I love the the family business stories, and there are a right. lot of them in the knife world. And to me, they're mm-hmm. you know, uh, I, what do I love more than you know knives? My family. So you put them together, right. it seems like a great a great thing. Right. How does your family work into your operation? Yeah. A uh, huge part of it. <clears throat> Number one, I absolutely couldn't do it without them and <clears throat> certainly never would have made it to this point without them. So uh, there's just the support and everything besides the actual help. 
so uh <clears throat> now currently at, so at one point like i said my daughter worked some you know off and on like part-time jobs growing up uh until she got into college and stuff and then she's she's off doing her own thing now but um my son, he did some off and on too, but then he's back with me working full time now. And he pretty much runs, he does almost all of our laser work, uh, runs the shipping department, answers a lot of the emails, uh, kind of the catch all for, for everything. Uh, other than the laser, he doesn't do a ton of stuff on the production side of the house. Although he does stuff like our McB clips that we sell, custom mm -hmm. clips and stuff. He pretty much handles making those. So not fair to say he doesn't do production stuff, but he doesn't work a whole lot on the Mac twos and stuff. Um, but handles almost everything else uh, my wife's a huge part of it she's uh um she's the one that told me to go full time when i was still doing this part time like she's she's the one that that pushed me to do it um uh, which uh was great because i don't know if i would have been brave enough to do it without her giving me the push so yeah. uh she's been right there always always guiding me helping me make good decisions and everything so uh uh, not to mention the support always goes and works all the shows with me. She does tons of stuff. She takes care of my payroll for me and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and hoping to have her do even more going forward because she'll be a huge asset. But uh, she has a, a good career on her own, too. So it's kind of like me when I switched over to full time. It's kind of kind of scary. I got to pull her along, I think, before long. But yeah, but, uh, yeah she's a huge asset. Um, and we actually built the new shop we built that I mentioned. It's uh, We actually moved... Uh, didn't just build a new shop we moved to a to a new location which is basically the home place where my wife grew up um which is across the road from her parents house so my my father-in-law he he makes the rounds and chop, stops in the shop a couple of, he's there today helping me get a uh, pump set up to put fluid in my uh cnc machine like this yeah we it's it's pretty cool to have the to have the whole family involved we we'd, we'd really like it. oh and actually i've got a one another one of my employees is a uh, second cousin i've got a part-time uh younger guy 16 year old that's a uh second cousin so so yeah we we try as much as possible to, to keep the family involved uh you were talking about your wife's contribution it it <clears throat> occurred to me it you know just struck me how uh, i think about this a lot like how uh, i'd be sort of a caveman without my wife in many ways and uh, that's not to say that it's a one-way street she gets a lot from me too for sure but uh, just having that, I don't know, the femininity or whatever the, whatever the temperament, like there are certain things that come with that, with a feminine temperament that are good for business that are different from what maybe the creative male, uh, in this situation might be bringing. All I'm saying right. is I think it's a very complimentary thing and it's probably yes, a good thing absolutely. to have your wife involved. Oh yeah. I'd have crashed and burned a long time ago if I'd ever even had the courage to get started. <laughs> I probably would have made knives, but as far as being able to make a business out of it, no, no doubt. I would have, if I ever even got started, I would have crashed and burned for sure. She, she keeps me, uh, keeps me level. And she helps me with a lot of decisions. She helps with a lot of the strategic decisions. Um, well, so much so that I basically named her the CFO of the company. I said, like, nice. look, I'm, you know, from this point on anything, you know, the, any machines I need to buy, any money I need to spend like that, I want to run it through you because, I mean, it helps me too, because that's, I mean, that's, that's a big deal going and making a big purchase of a machine or building a shop or something like that. So, you know, having somebody else to kind of say it's okay is <laughs> kind right. of a, kind of a nice thing to have. So yeah, she's got probably a lot better head on her shoulders for that. <laughs> oh, I was going to, go I was going to say oh, that more gently. <laughs> I was yeah, going to no. more gently say she's she's probably your gut check on a lot of things, you know, yeah, so why exactly. not about the most important thing, you know, your livelihood. That's right. That's um, right. Uh, so um, she must have been thrilled with the whole idea about the Mac, too. I mean, anyone who's, you know, in business in the knife business would be excited about this. Uh, something that we uh, sort of indicated, but I, I feel uh, deserves some underlining about the Mac 2 and the Mac uh, 3.5 is that this is. Uh, all even even though it's not uh you know you're getting parts machined elsewhere it's all united states based right yep that's been very important to me and definitely a distinction that we always try to make um i know it gets harder and harder today to buy anything that's american made you know on a regular basis but uh um and quality wise i mean that's i'm not necessarily making an argument one way or the, one way or the other that i mean people can look at knives and, and see what they think about the quality for themselves there's quality products coming out of all parts of the world um i just could not bring myself to outsource outside of the country it just just it just doesn't feel right and for me 
not faulting anybody else for doing it, but for me, it just doesn't fit with my my brand, um, who I am. So um, I've had dealers, people, you know, constantly trying to tell me, oh, you need to do, and, and I know it would be a good idea from a business standpoint, I'm probably an idiot for, for not. I mean, it, I would guaranteed be making more money right now because I'd be able to get more product out there, you know, at probably a cheaper price point and, you know, but I wouldn't feel right about it. And, and I'm kind of playing the long game. You know, I'm, I want to build the reputation that, you know, that this matters to me. And so that hopefully people that it matters to them, they'll, they'll tag along and, and stick with us. Uh, you, you were in the Marine Corps, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Well, this kind of, thank you a for your service and guarding our great country. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, but in a way, also the way you go about making this Mac two is almost a continuation of service. You're serving the country in a way because you're <laughs> keeping that business and that work here. You might not be making the same margins because you're not dealing with the same labor right. situations in other countries. But right, you know, uh, that's that's sort of kind of uh, a little bit of a sacrifice in there in your making these knives, and that's a you know sacrifice kind of like your service. Yeah. Yeah, never really thought about the sign that that way, but yeah, I guess so. I was thinking more like a just sacrificing the bottom line, but yeah, <laughs> but uh, it definitely it, it definitely is a sacrifice. I mean, and it's and it's not easy. I mean, there's really, besides the bottom line. I mean, even if you were making as much money off of them, it's it is hard. It is really hard in today's because you know so much of manufacturing has moved overseas, and that that trickles down to the job shops and the and the OEM shops that you would get to do this stuff, and it's just really hard and you have shops that that do a ton of stuff but they're not interested in doing you know 200 blades for some mm. knife maker they've never heard of i mean it's just the it's it's hard i mean if yeah if you could jump into it and be ready to make you know ten thousand knives right off the bat then you could probably get you know plenty of different places to do the work for you but when you're when you're trying to kind of bootstrap from the ground up and you know you can literally only afford to do a couple hundred knives at a time and it's it's not easy to find shops and find people that will that will work with you to be able to do that yeah all. and I, w I was gonna ask you what what was it like vetting these companies i mean they whether or not they're willing might almost be immaterial can they do this kind of work to the high precision right. you need right well luckily i, I was able like i said earlier I, I some of these are relationships that i've built and some of them are relationships through relationships you know this guy knows somebody and he takes care of of getting them to do the the lapping or the like i've never even met or talked to the guy that does the the lapping work on the blades and stuff but i have the trusted intermediary that that does and so he takes care of that and so it, yeah it, it's somebody i've worked with slowly built up and worked with on things over the years and um so the trust was there and we just do a lot of communicating back and forth a lot of <laughs> A lot of frustration sometimes back and forth trying to trying to figure out problems and why something didn't quite go right or whatever but but uh but all in all i've been really lucky with finding good people to work with for sure uh yeah uh, uh, the the whole concept of getting the parts back seems to me i don't know uh seems to me like the nerve-wracking part like are these all gonna oh, fit yeah. is everything gonna line up um Especially uh, if you make one little change that, I mean, some changes are obviously something that involves like the critical areas. Um, it, yeah, one, one little change you can, you know, oh, I want to do this. Oh, but if I do, you know, I want the blade to drop in the handle a little more, for example, for aesthetic reasons or something. Okay. Well, that affects where the detent ball falls on the blade. And so then if you've already got it dialed and the detent is hitting just about the right spot on almost every knife, and then you make that one little change uh you know if it was off on one blade it's not a big deal you get 200 400 500 blades back and it's wrong on all of them that's a big deal it's and that's what's going to happen because you're not going to you know it's not like customs where i mess up one at a time if you mess up you mess up two or three or four or five hundred at a time mm, so mm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's something you can save and sometimes it's not and even oh if you can God. save it, then that means more handwork, which again eats into your profit margin. And because right, right. you know I'm paying labor to work on them, so it, uh, it, yeah, little little things, which is back to the whole keeping this pipeline running the way I am and not messing with it because we've got it dialed in. You know, we we're gonna keep doing that because it's we we've, we've had we haven't had any catastrophes, but we've definitely had uh, we definitely had a few things that have caused us a lot of extra handwork and stuff that that mm -hmm. we 
didn't want to have to do because we didn't because I made a mistake or whatever. So it's oh that part's scary. Yeah, it's, yeah. Everything is multiplied. You know, like I said, you're no longer. I mean, it's bad to mess up a blade or something like that on a custom you've already got. You know, a week's worth of work in. But when you mess up five hundred blades, that <sighs> you know, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that can be bad in a hurry. I, I mean, that thankfully could... we haven't had anything catastrophic, but. Th that could ruin someone. I mean, yeah, couldn't it? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, all, it could. all of yeah, that I mean, money, if you all had to those eat parts. an entire batch of blades that you just couldn't use. I mean, yeah, if you're oh if you're operating at pretty close margins, I could that could do it for sure. Well, so absolutely. how do you how do you do your design work? We're talking about making changes and making alterations. Is your design work all happening in the virtual world? Are you a pencil guy? How how does this? Yeah. At this point, especially on the uh, performance machine stuff, it's pretty much all uh, virtual. It's all it's all on CAD. Um, it's just I like the natural flow that you can get with just pencil and paper and stuff. Um, and sometimes I may do something on pencil and paper and then uh, I don't usually like scan it in. Sometimes I'll literally just look at it and redraw it on the screen based on a hand drawing. But but usually I start pretty much just blank screen on CAD and go from there. Um, it's uh, it it's just so much easier to be able to see open closed positions. So, because I try to be really careful about designing things to you know not so they flow in the open position and in the closed position. And it's just, I mean, I I'm not sure some people have enough experience where they can just look at it and say you know without actually seeing it mm. close and say okay that's going to line up here, but I, I kind of need to see it rotate and see it land where it's going to land and then make tweaks from there. So, yeah, I, and that can be a challenge to do that, but not make it look overly computer drawn, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, not to, to make it look more natural and organic. It can be hard to draw something kind of organic looking on, on a computer. Um, so that, that can be a challenge for sure. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, um, you know, just when you draw, you have natural arcs in your wrist and in your, right. in your elbow and you start to see these gestures come out and, um, but the, the three point, uh, the, the Mac two just in general, it has a very, um, very classic look to me. It looks like a knife that is supposed to be, you know, kind of like the 110 or the buck 110 or something like that. It's, it's a clean and classic, um, uh, knife. What, what were you, what was your intention? I know I keep, I keep lurking around the Mac too. I think I'm, I think in my mind, <laughs> I'm getting, preparing myself to get one, but, but what were yeah. you, what were you thinking um, when you designed it? Like what were, the, what was the purpose? What, what were you really going for? Um, honestly. And because that one I designed specifically for, uh, I say that honestly, I don't remember. I think I pretty much designed it with the intention of it being a, you know, the, the type of building that we're doing, like an OEM type project. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I just wanted a really good, clean, basic frame lock, like just a really good, you know, less is more kind of take on the frame lock. And, and there's others out there. And I took, you know, just like anybody else, I, I found the design features that I kind of like as far as the overall, um, I, I knew I wanted a, I'd call it, I call it like a skinny waist. So like in the, pivot area i always like when a knife has a you know the blade looks wider and then it kind of gets Ooh, skinnier in the center around the pivot and mm -hmm. then it and it flows out and, and gets bigger out toward the end the butt end it, it just something about the the symmetry of the flowing lines with a skinny waist i, I don't know it just that was <laughs> Gee, i wonder I where that comes from <laughs> yeah i don't know where that comes from uh but, can you can yeah. you hold that up can we see the knife please yeah now this is actually the um it's beat all the crap but well, oh, let me man. get it right away in the camera this is the handmade prototype of the three inch mac II that i've been carrying ever since i made it um it's beat completely up i don't think i've ever even taken it apart and cleaned it um it's it's a little different uh we made a few tweaks you know over time since the handmade and of course this one's hollow ground and the um the other ones are flat ground but yeah pretty yeah, much the basic shape with a couple of small tweaks it's beautiful. Uh, I got to say it's, it's classic. It has that classic beauty. Um, there are a bunch of other knives. I would, I would put it on the shelf with design wise in terms of uh, some of the classic marks it hits. I'll spare you those. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 oh, I, they, they're probably some of my favorites too. If I had, to yeah. Guess, so. Yeah. I mean, to me there, you know, this is kind of like in the Sabenza 
line. It's sort of in the Spartan Harzy. Uh, yeah. Reminds me a little, not reminds me, but I would put it on the same shelf as the, what was that called? The Three Sisters Forge uh, knife yeah. from yep. a while yep. ago. And just yep. like, it looks real sturdy, but it's got a classy, uh, classy, okay. All, All right. Uh, by the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, exactly. And, and um all right. How'd you get into this? How'd you get into knives? Uh, I read on your website, you've always been into knives and your creative itch kind of brought it to the fore, but uh, yeah. where did this love come from? Um, I think I was born with it. <laughs> I mean, I literally cannot, I mean, I can't remember. It's not like I can remember, you know, Oh, I walked into the store and I saw this knife and Oh my God. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up, I mean, you can tell by listening to me. I'm, I'm pretty much a redneck. I mean, I grew up with, I mean, my dad always had an old timer in his pocket. My granddad always had an old timer, a case knife in his pocket. Like, I mean, knives were just part of life. And I mean, literally from the time I can remember, I was pretty much obsessed with them. I mean, we would have, uh, one thing I remember was we had a local uh, festival every year where I lived. It's called the Railroad Festival because it was a railroad town. Um, and it was just like, you know, arts and crafts type festival. And uh, um, there would be people there selling stuff. It was arts and crafts. There's always people there selling kind of flea market type stuff, you know. Um, and I was always there looking for the knives. And there would be guys there with the, I mean, this was, you know, you could walk up as a, you know, 10-year-old and buy a little pocket knife. You know, it wasn't a big deal then. Yeah. Um, and they were, I mean, they were like little pen knives and stuff. There was, you know, there wasn't much to them. But, but I, that. That was why I always wanted to go that in the monster truck my town had. Those were, that's why I always wanted to go to the to the uh, railroad festival every year. I mean, I, like I said, there was no tipping point. I, I honestly cannot remember a time when I wasn't obsessed with them. It just, yeah. yeah. And then the making part of it just kind of developed from that. That and I mean, my my parents were both. My mom was always, you know doing crocheting and sewing and, and things like that. My dad did woodworking and handyman stuff and stuff mm. like that. So um, nobody that really did anything like what I do other than, I mean, woodworking has its similarities, but it's, you know, nobody into actual metal work in my close family, but, but creative stuff, yeah. you know? And so I don't know, I just kind of always had, like I said, that creative itch and uh, never really quite found anything that I was looking for. I mean, I dabbled with sketching and doing different things and nothing. I was either, either wasn't passionate enough about it or just wasn't good enough at it <laughs> or, mm. or not passionate enough to get good at it, I guess. Um, but yeah, finally I just had kind of had it in my head that I always wanted to make a knife. And honestly, the internet, I mean, I know I looking back, I probably could have gone like to the library and found a book on it or something. But when it got to the point that, you know, stuff was on the internet and the forums were out there and I was actually looking through and seeing, you know, people talking about, oh, yeah, I made this, you know, and showing the stuff that they made. I was just floored. I was like, wow, I'm like people actually make these like in their garages. This is insane. So once I realized that and then it wasn't some big, you know, unobtainable, hmm. you know, process, then then I started really diving into it and reading and watching everything I could until and then just getting after it. That's interesting. It's like uh, there are certain things. Yeah, I also uh, grew up in a creative family, and there are certain things that I know I'm capable of. I don't know anything about cars, honestly, uh, but I do know that I could learn them. Just with my mind, the way I think, I know I could learn right. cars and be a, a good mechanic. Um, I, I'm not ever sure I could ever learn chemistry or that sort of abstracting. <laughs> so, so I kind of get right. that. It's, so um, it, it's kind of interesting that you you. Uh, take a look at this thing that you love and you're like, this is something I could do. And, um, you start making it and, and then you, you get this feeling from making something that, you know, can be used. Um, I don't know. Some, something about that is different from creating a, uh, a painting or a drawing that is yeah. just going to be appreciated. And that's right. good too. Uh, but the, right. the fact that that knife is going to get used has a lot yeah. of mileage. It does. Yeah, it does. Plus, I think we all just have it. I mean, I think it's in our DNA to a certain amount. I mean, maybe some people more than others, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's been around a little bit. People have been using them for a long time. So, I mean, I just think we're all just kind of connected to, to those basic tools like that, that we've been using as humans for, for years and years and years. So, um, just kind of a primal feel to it. It's just, some of us, it's just like anything else. Some of us are more drawn to it than others, but but it's definitely there. I mean, there's definitely something there beyond just, you know, oh, I saw a knife when I was a kid and it was cool, so I love yeah. knives. Like, 
I, I don't know. It's right. It's it's part of our epigenetics. It's like a, a, a yeah. Uh, what do they call it? Like genetic memory. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I could definitely believe that. I, I just. I mean, it would definitely explain a lot why some people like. I mean, like myself, it just. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. It's just there, you know. Yeah. It, it really is. So. Snakes bad, knives good. You know, yeah. I just know that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Don't what have was to be taught. So what was that first shop like? You know, you, 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 I, I know you didn't just jump right into it and buy all this no. stuff. What was it like? No, that's definitely not my, no, I, um, matter of fact, the, the, you know, do it. I said we were in a creative family. It's also very much a do it yourself kind of family. We didn't have a lot of money and stuff. So it's like, it's not like we were running out and buying everything we needed. We, we lived mostly off of a garden, um, that kind of stuff. At one point we raised chickens, like just, I mean, we weren't full on farmers or anything, but definitely lived in a do it yourself kind of household. So it wasn't, you know, Oh, you need something. The first inclination was to make it not go out and buy it. Um, so, uh, I did when we moved into the house that we're just moved out of, um, I knew that I wanted to shop. If I already had the itch then, I already kind of knew I wanted to make a knife at that point. I just hadn't full on committed to it. Um, but I definitely knew I needed a shop to do something in and get out of my wife's hair. So, uh, so when we moved in, I was able to build a shop immediately. Um, not specifically for knife making, but, but that's what it turned into. Um, and then not too long, I don't know. I think we've been maybe moved in a year or so, something like that before I, you know, I just had discovered the forums and really started kind of getting the bug to try to do it myself and started learning some of the, you know, the, the right tools and that kind of stuff. But, uh, I had a, I think it was one of the little cheap four by 36 grinders that is like Harbor Freight and it has a little disc on the side or whatever. Um, and I don't know where, I, what steel I had. I think it was mild steel. I didn't even know the difference at that point between, you know, mild steel and hardenable steel or anything. So I think I, my wife said, I told her one day, Hey, I'm going back here to the shop, try to make a knife. And then I came back a few hours later with something that was a roughly knife shaped object, but definitely not a knife. <laughs> um, <laughs> not by my standards anyway. <laughs> um, but, uh, managed to, I don't think that actually I might have been better off with a file, honestly, than that, than that grinder. It was, it was pretty pitiful. Uh, but fought through it and, and ground a couple of things on it that at least roughly had an edge. Uh, and actually, my son, the first uh, little bit, he, at that point, I uh, forget, he was young teenager, I guess, probably 12 or 13. And he, he went back there with me and kind of fiddled with it a little bit. He he lost interest fairly quickly. I think, I mean, you had to really like it to keep going at it with this setup, I promise you. It was, <laughs> you had to be committed, so I don't blame him. Um then pretty quickly after that, I decided I needed a grinder, but from the get go, even, even then I wasn't really ready to like, just go out and like spend money on the stuff. Like I was already kind of looking at it as a business as if, you know, okay, when I can make the money off of, I can make knives good enough to sell and make money off of them. Then I will go and buy a real grinder or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I've cobbled together. I had a little like half horsepower bench grinder, but it had variable speed on it, oh, which nice. was awesome at the time. Yeah. Um, so I found plans for a no weld knife making thing on uh, USA knife maker. I took those and, uh, roughly made something out of that. That was not at all what the plans were, but I got the general gist of it. So then I took stuff I had like a piece of a cut off four by six from one of the posts of my shop, um, when it was built and a piece of aluminum tubing or, um, steel tubing. And basically I cobbled together something that had an upright. It had an arm with the uh, with the tracking wheel on it, and I found a plastic lawnmower wheel at Lowe's that fit onto the arbor of the uh, bench grinder, and that was my drive wheel. And I made it built a platen. Oh, wow. So basically, it was powered by that, um, and it worked. It was a franking grinder from hell, but it it worked um, and ground. I don't know how hundreds of knives on that thing. I finally broke down and bought a real grinder when. Um, and it would fit the two by seven. It started out actually, I think, with a two by, maybe it was like a two by 42 or something. And then I, I eventually stretched it out and made it a two by 72. Um, so I was able to actually at least use real knife maker belts. But mm -hmm. like I said, it was, it was a half horsepower. So it was basically, <laughs> it was bog it down. Especially when I, so I, I got into building, before I got done with that thing, I started building these big choppers. And I'm saying, I'm talking like a nine or 10 inch blade, big chopping knives. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to grind those on that thing. And you talk about taking all day long with that thing bogging down. 
So that was kind of the the final kick in the pants. Okay, you've got to buy a real grinder. So I went out and bought a KMG with a three horsepower motor that would eat you if you if you got in it. So you won't bog it down. Um, so yeah. So then I then I was able to buy my first real grinder. But I I ground several hundred knives, I guess, on that on that little Franken grinder before I finally moved on. So this was like a shed or something outside of your house with an extension cord in the hole. <clears throat> Literally, literally an extension cord. I had so I mean the building was okay. It was, it was just a basic uh twenty by twenty, it's a four hundred square foot metal building. We mm-hmm. did have a concrete slab that a buddy of mine helped me pour, uh, which was awful. You'd almost trip on it walking over it. The ripples and stuff in it were so bad. Um, but I ins- I ended up the first I didn't. Several years into it, I ended up insulating it. So mm-hmm. Winter it wasn't work. too bad. Yeah. So um, so yeah. I mean, literally had no power back there. It was probably. So the house had a uh, privacy fence behind it and the ha- and then a little small space and then the woods at the back of the lot. And uh, the shop was back there basically between the fence and the woods. And yeah, for I don't know how long, we just ran an extension cord back there. And then I got my dad back to the do-it-yourself thing. I got my dad to come and help me. We I got a big piece of uh, like underground cable from a, from a buddy in construction. And we, my dad came and helped me wire it up and we ran that back to the house and had kind of official wiring. And that's the way it's still wired up now. I mean, that's the way we used it all the way up until we just moved out of it this year. So, um, yeah, probably not OSHA approved, but, but we made a lot of knives in there. It was very convincing how you said kind of official electricity. Kind of official. <laughs> it's it's always cool to see. Um, you know, Jim Jim just had some of your um, older work uh, folders up. I love that Warren Cliff. I I don't know what it's called, but it's so beautiful. It's really cool to see older work, knowing that this was this stuff was done. You know, in various stages of your career, but before this right. point, you know, right. these right. knives happened in your older shop, your smaller shop, and right. It's always yep. amazing to see the beautiful stuff that can come out of what we consider modest, um, yeah. you know, accommodations. Right. Yeah. I think the one clip you're speaking of, if, it's, if I'm not mistaken, is probably the one the collab I did with JVO Design. Oh, um, that looks like a JVO. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 We did a, a couple of different collaborations. I, th- I saw it scroll past earlier there. I think that yeah. was one of those. Yeah. Yeah. I've been lucky to to collab with a few really good people that 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 always helps and you learn a lot especially when you're doing you know you start actually making stuff that's other people's designs it Mm -hmm. it can be a little eye-opening as far as you know how exactly how they do things so um that that's always a good call i feel like to to get a chance to definitely collab with somebody yeah that's yeah yeah that's the jvo well, so so to that point, so you're talking about collaborating with a, 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 a Jared von von Otterloo as a Canadian knife designer, yeah. and now he is he is working on his own knives, which he's very modest killing about. It. They, yeah. they look beautiful yeah, he's to me, it. but he's yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, so that's you working with another another knife guy, another um, you know independent mm-hmm. knife person. But you've you've also worked with Spiderco on the McBee. Uh, that right. beautiful little Warncliffe locking folder. That's kind of the, seems like the opposite scenario. You're not working with one right. other creative being, you're working with a whole entity. What was that like? Right. Uh, it's been really good. I, the, guy, the people at Spiderco are just amazing people. Um, it's from a design side, um, it's, it's not really different because there, wasn't, there really wasn't, basically they, I showed them my design, um, they liked it well enough to start doing it. And honestly, they changed a couple of things just to make it work with their manufacturing, you know, but, but other than that, there wasn't like back and forth really on, on the design stuff. It was pretty much, you know, Hey, I've been making this model, you know, see if you might be interested in in doing a collab on it. And, and then it was a lengthy process. A couple of years later then, yeah, I think we'll do it. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, it's been great, but it's been kind of more of a, I guess a business relationship than like a design, you know, building type of relationship just because of it was, it was design was pretty much already established and then Mm -hmm. they just decided to make it. Yeah. Well, so what kind of things uh, did they change to make it, um, to make your custom design work for their huge scale manufacturing? Um, Not, not a ton, honestly. Um, They do, they do put their clip on it. Of course, you can mm-hmm. probably tell from, from looking at it. That's, that's not the, 
the kind of clip that I would usually put on the customs. Um, so they put they put one of their style clips on there, um, and they use uh, threaded standoffs with screws from both sides. Uh, when I make the customs, I do them with a uh, drilled and tapped lock side, and a if I use standoffs, then I use uh, just uh, through hole standoffs and a screw. So a normal frame lock construction where it goes through the standoff and then screws into the other side. Okay. Um, but this that's you know. It's, it's honestly a lot easier to just have threaded standoffs from a manufacturing standpoint and, you know, a lot less risky than tapping through a titanium slab. So um, oh, yeah. I get why they did it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's totally fine. I mean, and they, I mean, they use, uh, I mean, obviously they used their, a little different hardware or whatever they, uh, but they did do a really good job of making like the pivots. They re, you know, recreated my little dimpled pattern that I like to do on them by hand. Um, Honestly, they that's that's about it. I mean, they everything else at least looks wise is pretty much spot on to the way I do them. So it was almost it's almost scary good to be honest with you, like how well they could reproduce it. It's it's really good. They replaced you, Jonathan. Yeah, pretty <laughs> Spider much. Spider Co has taken <laughs> with an entire factory. I'll take yeah. that. <laughs> if it takes the whole factory. <laughs> so what about steel? Do they give you a choice of steel? Um, I'm trying to remember, but we've had it out for a little while now. I, I think they like kind of told me, ran it by me. Um, I don't really remember it being like a, Hey, do you want a or B? But, uh, they did tell me, and I, I would assume that if it was something I was unhappy with, I could have, you know, could have said something, but I, I mean, I love CTS XHP, so Same. I had no problem there. So yeah. Um, not at all. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's gone really well. Like they they and they've been really good to me. I've I've really enjoyed working with them. So um, they're always super friendly and kind of treat us treat us like royalty when we're around at shows and stuff. Oh, so can't so beat cool. that. Yeah, and they're I mean they just consistently put out an excellent product. I'm not always yeah. crazy about the designs, but that's that's part of what I love about them. Sometimes they're you know. You remember the movie? You go e. out on a limb, you're going to alienate some people. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. If you get if you don't stick right down the middle, then there's going to be people that love them and people that hate them. So exactly, you know, you 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 can love them for being creative and and putting themselves out there, and then you know, it's it's just a matter of taste. Some of them, I don't I don't love every design, but I'm like you, I love the fact that they're willing to do them. You know? Yeah, and there's some that I love. You know, yes, so. Yeah. I mean, they did something, uh, you know, they're, they're very, um, um, uh, married to the, their, their trademark, uh, circular, sure. uh, circle hole, uh, opening hole, but also if it's a fixed blade, you know, they put it in there. Um, right. uh, and, and I think that that's a, a cool sort of calling card in a way. And sometimes right. it uglies up the knife. They took the, uh, what was it? The, the lion steel SR 11 model and turned it into the, the spy opera, and uh, yeah, they they, yeah. they took the sleek line and they put this giant, bloop, you know, it looked yeah. like the uh, the the top gunner turret of an old you know bomber from right. World War II. Yeah. But I loved it. It was audacious, yeah. and and they're like, no, this yeah. is us, and this is how we do it. Right. And I love it. Yeah, yeah, that, and there's a lot to be said. I mean, the thing the thing that really struck me. Uh, I mean, I think you could say he was talking about the edge, but I think you could probably apply the same thinking to the to the opening with the hole. Um, I actually got lucky enough to talk to Sal for a few minutes at Blaze Show this year, and he was telling me, he was emphasizing how, I think we were talking about some design stuff, and then, like, you know, Eric was was doing some cool stuff um, now, and he was saying that back in his day, you know, when he was doing everything, he he was all about the cut. That's what he said. I'm all, I was always all about the cut, you know, so the performance of it and mm -hmm. designing it. But I took what he meant from that, not strictly literally just the edge, but the ergonomics of the handle, the opening, you know, the, the function of the knife. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that, you know, when you look back at their lineup and the, and the things that he did and, uh, you know, coming up with one handed opening and uh, the whole, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. The, the pocket clip. I mean, he, I don't think he honestly gets enough credit. Um, you know, Spider Co's looked at as a company now, and everybody's sprint run this, and oh, well, this model or that, the collaboration. But, yeah. but I don't necessarily think that Sal gets enough credit for for exactly what he did for the knife world. I mean, you think about it. You know, we didn't have pocket clips and one handed openers. Where would we be? Oh my gosh, foot yeah. makers would be in good shape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, um, I, I remember seeing uh, in the in the Spike Lee movie Summer of Sam about the son of Sam murders and. 
in the 70s in New York City. And there's a character who's dancing on stage and he opens up a knife with a one handed opener and it ruined the whole movie for me. I'm like, this is like <laughs> 1974. That technology right. did not I exist. Sal Glesser was <laughs> way to ruin a movie, yeah. Bob. <laughs> yeah. So when funny. you were talking about your shop and how you how you 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 your first shop and how you built it up with your dad or, or how you you poured the slab and you you DIY'd right. it. Um, it, it occurred to me, one of the things that I keep coming back to thematically about knives and, and I, like you have always been into them trying and I try and figure out what it is. And oftentimes I, I get, I get highfalutin about it. And, and it, it really is a self-reliance thing. Like, uh, when I was growing up in the seventies, the entertainment I watched in the seventies and eighties, uh, men always had a knife on their hip, you know, and that's, that's what a man mm -hmm. had, you know, along yep. with everything else, the skill to right. use it and the ability to survive, they had that knife. And it was a symbol of self-reliance. And, you know, I wonder if that has anything to do with your fascination with it. And especially coming from such a DIY family. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Like I said, I mean, besides besides seeing on TV and movies and stuff like that, I mean, like I said, it was literally, I mean, it was it was a guarantee that, that it, you know, at any given time, my dad was going to have an old timer pocket knife, a pair of nail clippers and some change in his pocket. I mean, that there was always going to be. You know, he didn't necessarily carry like a belt knife. He had a couple of cool ones that I always liked to look at and play with, you know, when if he if he got them out. But but he was always I mean, I mean, he didn't carry it because he was necessarily, you know, like me and just, you know, carry it because it's cool or whatever. But mm -hmm. like he, you know, he he needed it, you know, he used it pretty much every day, you know, and, and a lot of the people did. So it's I mean, it just it's yeah, absolutely. It's just kind of ingrained in you from an age that that's like that's something you're supposed to do. So it's supposed to be able to use and, you know, you can use a knife. You've got a knife, you can drive a car, you can drive a stick shift. You, you know, <laughs> you want to be able to do all those things that kind of, you know, I guess for us as guys, I mean, I know there's plenty of ladies that are in the knives too. So they probably, there might be some, some other reason with them, but for us, I mean, it was kind of part of like being a manly man, you know, having, um, having a good knife and knowing how to use it, knowing how to sharpen it. Like, yeah, those are all things I would consider like man skills, you know? So yeah, yeah, I, I definitely could agree with that. You, so we talked about the Mac two a lot and, uh, and we talked a little bit about the McB, uh, the Mac two, your, your hard use locking folder, um, the, the McB kind of a fifth pocket, do everything, little utility knife, um, but then you have this super cool knife, and this is way up my alley. The little and, and I'm sorry, I'm spacing on the name now. But the two ring, the two ring, oh, uh, the retainer, double yeah. edge. Oh god, yeah. So that yeah. I love that knife. Uh, tell me a little bit about yeah. that knife. You don't happen to have one near you, do you? Um, I'd have to step away. I've got one another, and I did. Honestly, I would have never expected you to ask about that one, or I would have had it right here. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's okay. Um, I, I that love it. I think it's so cool. A lot, to be honest with you, like there's a certain crowd that that sees that knife and likes it and gets it, and then everybody else just kind of looks at it and says, "Oh, that's that's kind of cool." And they kind of, <laughs> I see it at shows and stuff. Like they'll be laying on the table, and you you can see the certain person. It'd be like maybe one out of every twenty people that'll come by, and you'll see that little twinkle in their eye, and you know, like, oh yeah, he he gets it. He he knows what what that knife is about. Um, but the other 19, they're just like, oh, that's a dangerous looking raptor claw. Like, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, they don't quite get it. But um, I tell you, it, will it mess up if I what, get home back in like two seconds? I've yeah, really got yeah, one sure. door right here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, right, I'll, I'll, I'll wax seconds. poetic about it for a second. Here it is right, right here. Uh, so, so the retainer, anyone who has watched this show knows what I like about this. It's a curved double edged blade. Uh, and, but it has these two finger rings and a very interesting, unexpected orientation when you hold and use it. And Jonathan will show us this, but yeah. Uh, All right. So, and honestly, a lot of the people that do kind of get it, it, it's not, to me, it's very intuitive, but I came up with it. So I guess that makes sense. But right, right. to most of the people that I have actually shown it to, it's not super intuitive. But once I explain it for a second you can really see the light come on. So, all right. So it's designed to be put on the first two fingers here like this. Most people pick it up and put it on the two center fingers because they're thinking about punching with it. Well, that gives you zero control over it. This thing's mm -hmm. going to, if you try to pull with it or whatever, it, it's just going to wobble around. All right. It's designed to go like this and this little 
that's literally a thumb ramp right there that's made to cap your thumb over. Mm. The the first thing I was designing for with this was to be able to do pull cuts. So when you do a pull cut, the knife, when it makes contact with something, it's going to want to torque this way, right? right? So having your thumb capped over that, that little thumb ramp means as you're making the cut, you, you're able to reply torque the other direction to fight the knife if it catches on something and wants to torque your fingers back that way. <laughs> and so then it was just natural to make it double edge so you could also cut on the on the back cut. And then truth be told, the punch dagger part of it just ended up being a lucky coincidence. I, I designed it for, for a pull cut and then a, a back cut. And then I just thought, well, I wonder if I could punch with it. And I tried it and sure enough, it punches and leaves a nasty hole because it's such a thin uh, tip profile and everything. It, mm-hmm. it really, and but it's curved. So it ends up cutting the hole. I mean, the blade is, I don't remember what the measurement is. It's less than an inch wide, but I bet it cuts an inch and a half hole when you, when you punch into like soft tissue with it. It's, it's nasty. Um, very perfect fact of kind of like what I was saying about the saw lesser, like very, you know, very purpose driven and, yeah. and all about the cut on yeah. that one. It, it definitely, um, it's a great little defensive tool. I mean, you, I always said that you don't really have to have, I mean, you need to know the basic concept of how the knife's designed to be used. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, you don't want to just stick it on any old, you know, your middle two fingers or something like that. But once you know what I just told you, the yeah. those basics, I wouldn't want to fight a four-year-old with one of these on their hands. Like, I mean, <laughs> they are dangerous. I mean, you know what I mean, like, yeah. what what can you and, and the calling it the retainer is is a kind of the double entendre. It's the um, it's partially because I don't really see a good way to somebody short of knocking you out. I don't know how anybody's going to get this away from you. Mm-hmm. You're going to retain them. How they can't? There's nothing for them to grab. That I mean. If they do get it away from me by grabbing it, then they can have it because if they were willing to suffer that much damage, then I guess they just earned it because I, I don't see how they can take it away from you. Uh, the second thing being, um, I've sold quite a few to law enforcement and they'll use it on their offhand side as a as a backup weapon. And so, for example, if they're if they're grappling, somebody tries to go for their firearm and they're in a grappling situation, a lot of times they'll be clamped down with their other hand trying to keep the person from ripping their pistol out of the holster or whatever. They can reach over here, draw this and basically cut the person off of them and helps them to retain their firearm. So you can retain it. And then the good thing about it is um, when you, if you do that, so say, uh, I mean, a law enforcement officer or even a civilian, if you're, if you're in a grappling match or whatever with somebody and you have it in your off hand and then you do need to escalate to a firearm, you can actually pull the firearm and still shoot and function. You can still work the slide. You mm-hmm. can't even reload. Mm-hmm. It takes a little bit of practice because you got to make sure you don't, you know, stab yourself as you reach yeah. back. But but you you can for sure function to to draw, shoot, and even rack the slide and everything else without. Because I mean, a normal. I mean, lots of people make backup knives. I mean, it's not a a new concept. Right. But if you have to escalate and go to a pistol, what do you do with a knife? You throw it down on the ground in the middle of a fight when you don't know it. if he's got a buddy. You know, right? You don't yeah. resheath it. You throw it down, and where somebody else may pick it up and stab you while you're engaging the initial threat or whatever. So, so being able to still—I mean, I guess you could still kind of hold on to a regular knife, but not as yeah, not as not sure as conveniently as, as you can that one. Like, right? I mean, you can basically just forget about it and and do what you need to do, and then you know, and it's about as out the of the way as it can. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Right. It's about as out of the way as it can be uh, also at the uh, at the same yeah. time. I noticed that it's chisel ground for what is most people's offhand, which is left side, right? It's right. chisel ground and and you see and the bevels right. from that. Um, but I'm, I'm a sucker for and really believe in the effectiveness of chisel grind in terms of just sheer uh, sharpness. And then also oh, in yeah. terms of, uh, you know, self-defense, it, 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 uh, you know, it does track funny through material a little bit and it does do really bad. You know, you can do a lot of damage. Yeah. With it, is what yeah. I'm saying. You're not, you're not using that knife to try to, you know, try to precisely whittle out a, a chest piece to, right. you know, put on your mantle. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's for pretty specific purposes. So, you know, if you're, if you're a, you know, a fraction of an inch off on your cut, if, you know, I mean, if the, if the edge pulls you just a little bit off track, I don't think it's going to make any difference on what you're trying right. to accomplish. Um, and I actually, when I originally made these, um, I started making these 
um, just, I guess, customs back in the day, I'd have them water jet cut and I'd hand grind them. And I'd actually, I actually did grind them as a dagger grind on both sides. But number one, that's a lot. So grinding four, four mm. grinds on a curved mm. blade is, is not easy to do. Um, then when I decided to do them as part of the performance machine line and have them CNC ground, it just didn't make sense to to have them done on both sides. And then once once I kind of thought that through, I kind of wished I'd been doing them as as chisel grinds all along because, from, like you said, from a function standpoint, they're actually probably better like that. I and, would imagine they're a lot sharper like that. Like yeah, like yeah, twice they're, as they're sharp. super sharp. Yep, they're they're very sharp. And then they have you know then you can basically have a flat side of the sheet, which makes it a little mm -hmm. easier for mm -hmm. attaching you know attachments and stuff like that, depending on how you want to carry it. So. Yeah, should have should have done that from the get go, but uh, <laughs> didn't didn't think about it. Hung up uh, on double grinds. But before we wrap up on the retainer, I, I have to say it is it, though it has rings, and obviously they are inter an integral part of the of the whole design. It is it is far from a karambit. It does have the curved blade. It has the right. rings, but um, karambit, you know. Um, I mean, you could give a karambit to a monkey and they could do damage, but to really use a karambit, you know, in a high stakes, high adrenaline situation, you, you need a good, good deal of training. Um, right. it, it looks like, uh, with, with the retainer, just as long as you remember to, to cap that, you know, and that's, that becomes a muscle memory intuitive thing right. after two days of playing around with it. Cause it's so damn cool right. anyway. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, so those rings seem like a real, uh, um, uh, uh, position of strength to be holding that from, whereas on, on a cram, right. but I always kind of feel like, yeah, my finger might just get yeah. jacked up in this if I need, you know. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know some people worry about degloving and things like that when you get, but I mean, plus the fact one that you have two fingers in there and the way you hold it, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't feel like there's that much of a chance that, that you're going to have to worry about that. And like, yeah, it's. I mean, it's also there's no there's no movement moving parts to a karambit, but there's definitely movement to the you know proper use of one or whatever or, or can right. be you know I mean it, right. everybody thinks about you know retracting and extending it and all that on this one I mean it's yeah the rings aren't made for any kind of movement they're just strictly made to hold on to um, yeah. anchor to, to give you a, a grip exactly um, with the minimal amount of uh, you know material to to hold on to the minimal amount of weight and like I said, so that you can retain it. I mean, the house, I mean, even a, you could take that exact same knife and, and just replace the, the rings with a, with a, like a T handle, mm -hmm. like a more traditional looking push dagger. And as far as the, the cutting of it and, you know, you can still punch with it the same and you, you could probably still cut the same with it, but it would be easier to get disarmed with it you know, or even to accidentally, you know, you're, you're going through and it and it snags and it catches on, on a belt or a belt buckle or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, it would be much easier for that to get torqued out of your hand and lose it than that. Plus you're back to, I mean, you could still function with a firearm with a, you know, with a T handle, but it's still not the same. I mean, you literally can just forget about that one once you trans, I mean, it's not going anywhere. It's just yeah. going to dangle from your fingers. So you don't yeah. have to worry about gripping it or anything anymore. Yeah, I feel like that T that T handle on a push dagger would have to be pretty damn slender not to affect your grip. You know, it would definitely right, be a exactly. compromise. Whereas this, you don't feel well, Jonathan. I got a couple other questions I'm going to ask you, but I think I'm going to save that for All the right. Patreon uh, extras right. interview. So everybody, uh, if you want to check out a uh, couple a couple of more minutes of conversation uh, with Jonathan McNeese, uh, check us out on Patreon. Uh, go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and we can you can hear us talking there jonathan it's been a pleasure meeting you and and talking about My your pleasure. work and uh i'm really excited for you and and i'm excited to get a mac uh two 3.5 in hand uh, by hook or by crook uh before i do <laughs> let you go actually uh let everybody know how they can get their hands on these knives and your other knives got you so our website is just mcneese knives actually you can go to mcneese knives or mcneese custom knives where i'm kind of working on a name change to dropping the custom out of it just mm -hmm. i mean makes sense with the direction we're headed um but i have both domains so either one you go to will take you to the same place so just mcneese knives.com um right now we're not selling hardly we did a couple of pre-sales um of the mac twos of just like the first 50 we sold on our site uh, right now we're basically just trying to feed all of our dealers so 
other than maybe an occasional uh, special four or five or something over the next probably six months or more, I plan on most of the 3.5s going out through dealers. So um, we're going to wait and we work with honestly most of the of the bigger dealers and a lot of the not not the bigger ones. Um, we're about to update a web page on the site that will have a list of the dealers with links going to them. I'm just running behind on getting that done, but um, you can you can check us out on Instagram, of course, just at McNeese Knives, um, and and keep up to date. And we have an email address that uh, email list that you can sign up on through the website. But but yeah, for the most part, right now on the three point five dealers are kind of the place to watch. Great. All right. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's been a pleasure, sir. All My right. pleasure. Take care. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. So McNeese Knives is a another awesome American success story, American dream story. It's a it's a family business making knives and going places, growing. I love the growth part. And uh so uh, there you have it. Uh, if you want to find, if you want to hear more with me and Jonathan, uh, check us out on Patreon, as I mentioned before. Also, check us out next Sunday for another uh, interview with an awesome knife person. And then, of course, there's Wednesday for the supplemental show and Thursday night knives. Your opportunity to join the live stream at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, well, until next time, uh, for Jim working his magic right there behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.